All right, let's jump right into something we as clinicians deal with every single day, the engine of the jaw. We're talking about the four primary muscles of mastication. A deep understanding of this system is absolutely crucial for our practice, so let's get into it. Here's our game plan for this explainer. We'll start with the system's overall job and its shared infrastructure. You know, the plumbing and wiring. Then we'll break down each of the four main muscles one by one. And finally, we'll connect all that anatomy back to what we see in the clinic every day. Everything we're about to discuss really boils down to this number, four. Just four primary muscles that work together in this incredibly coordinated dance to power all the complex movements of the mandible. Okay, so let's start at the beginning. What is the fundamental job of this whole muscular system? What's its core purpose? You know, we say mastication, but it's so much more than just simple opening and closing. It involves these five key movements you see here. This whole ballet of elevation, depression, pushing forward, pulling back, and side-to-side -side grinding, that's what allows for efficient chewing. And the muscles we're about to cover, they are the prime movers for every single one of these actions. Now, before we dissect each muscle individually, it's way more efficient to cover the infrastructure they all share. If we understand the common nerve and blood supply first, it really provides a great foundation for everything else that follows. The vascular supply is, thankfully, pretty simple. There's one key source you have to remember, the maxillary artery. It's a branch off the external carotid, and it's the main pipeline that provides all the arterial blood this high-performance muscle group needs. And now for the command and control center. This is huge. All motor signals, every single command, comes from one critical source, the mandibular nerve. That's the third division of the trigeminal nerve, CNV3. And it's so important to remember, this is the only division of the trigeminal nerve that carries motor fibers. And here you can see the specifics. It's like a perfectly organized circuit board. The mandibular nerve sends out these dedicated named branches to each muscle. You've got the deep temporal branches heading to the temporalis, the masseteric nerve to the masseter, and so on. It's a very clear and direct wiring diagram from V3 to each muscle. All right, let's move on to our first major muscle, the temporalis. This thing is a true powerhouse, and it's responsible for both that powerful bite and the more subtle movement of pulling the jaw back. You can't miss its classic fan shape, right? It just spreads right across the temporal fossa. And that shape isn't just for looks, it's the key to its function, allowing different parts of the muscle to pull in different directions, which we're about to see. So check this out. The crucial detail is right here in the action row. It originates up in the temporal fossa and inserts onto the coronoid process. Those vertical fibers at the front and middle, they pull straight up. That's your pure biting force. But the more horizontal fibers at the back, they're responsible for pulling the mandible backward or retracting it. This is exactly why it can be a major source of tension headaches when it gets overworked. Next up is the masseter. I mean, this is arguably the most powerful muscle of the group. When you think of pure clenching force, you're thinking of the masseter. It's this thick, multi-layered muscle that you can feel immediately. Just ask a patient to clench their teeth, and boom, there it is. Its location right on the surface makes it super easy to examine. And it's often the first place we feel for hypertrophy in patients we suspect have bruxism. Now, this is what's so important from a clinical standpoint. Its main job is, of course, powerful elevation. But look closer. Its different layers actually have opposing functions. The deep fibers help pull the jaw back, while the superficial fibers help push it forward. It's a remarkably versatile muscle with incredible fine-tuned control. All right, let's go a little deeper now into the infratemporal fossa to look at the pterygoids. Think of these as the muscles that guide all the more nuanced side-to-side -side movements that are so essential for grinding. Working as a team, the medial and lateral pterygoids are really the primary drivers of protrusion, that's moving the jaw forward, and those side-to-side -side or excursive movements. You can almost think of them as the steering system for the mandible. Okay, the medial pterygoid. This one acts as a partner to the masseter and temporalis. It helps with both elevation and protrusion, and it actually forms this powerful muscular sling with the masseter around the angle of the mandible. Now, because it's tucked away so deep, when this muscle gets inflamed or goes into spasm, it can be a source of really significant pain, and it's very often involved in cases of trismus. And here we have a truly unique player. The lateral pterygoid is the only muscle of mastication that actively opens or depresses the mandible. But now, look really closely at that insertion. 
Part of it goes right into the articular disc of the TMJ itself. This is absolutely critical. It means that a spasm or dysfunction in this one muscle can directly lead to disc displacement, which gives you that clicking and popping. It is a prime suspect in so many TMJ disorders. This slide just puts it all together beautifully. The medial helps close, the lateral helps open. The lateral is the main muscle for pushing the jaw forward, while the medial just assists. But, and this is key, they work together, contracting one side at a time to produce that grinding motion we need for chewing. It's a perfect example of an agonist-antagonist pairing. So, we've geeked out on the anatomy. Awesome. But why does all this detailed information matter when you've got a patient in the chair? Let's connect this knowledge directly to diagnosis and patient care. I mean, this is our bread and butter, right? Myofascial pain from grinding, TMJ dysfunction from muscular imbalances, and even acute conditions like muscle inflammation or lockjaw. Every single one of these conditions is rooted directly in the anatomy we've just covered. And this is a clinical takeaway we can never forget. While trismus is often post-operative or maybe from an infection, it can also be a major red flag for a more serious pathology, like a deep space infection or even a neoplasm. Our precise anatomical knowledge is what helps us build a thorough differential diagnosis. And that really leaves us with this final thought. When a patient comes in with pain, are we just thinking about the joint or are we thinking about the specific actions of the deep masseter fibers versus the posterior temporalis? Can we better isolate the source of the problem by truly understanding this intricate system? That level of precision, that's where anatomy meets clinical excellence.